Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for today's webinar is solar plus storage fire safety training, single and multifamily residential. Before we pass this over to our guest speaker today, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees are in listen-only mode. That means that uh, we can't hear you, but hopefully you can hear us. Uh, you have a couple of options to join the audio portion of our webinar today. You can call in using a telephone, or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize the webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here. And that arrow can also be used to expand the webinar console. And one of the things that you can do with your webinar console is to type in your questions and your comments. We will be saving about 15, 20 minutes following our presentation for a Q&A with the audience. And we would like to get to as many questions as we can. So please type your questions in when you think of them. Um, don't wait until the very end to type your questions in. Um, we, we've got a lot of people registered. We expect to have a lot of questions. So we'll try to get to as many as we can. A final note, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording within about 48 hours, probably this afternoon. Um, and we'll also be putting those materials on our website at cleanegroup.org backslash webinars. So with that, I'd like to now pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, Marielle Mango. Mari is a project director here at Clean Energy Group, and she is going to get us started. Mari, over to you. Thanks, Sam, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. We have a really exciting webinar coming up. Um, before I introduce today's presenter, I'm going just to give a quick introduction as to who we are at Clean Energy Group. Clean Energy Group is a national nonprofit organization based in Vermont. We work to advance innovation and in clean energy technologies through policy, finance, and individual project level support. Our work is funded through support from a number of private foundations, including those shown here. We also have a sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance, which is a membership coalition of organizations, primarily state agencies, that manage clean energy funds. This presentation today is brought to you by Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project. Uh, Clean Energy Group formed the Resilient Power Project after Superstorm Sandy and the resulting outages that hit the Northeast. Since then, we've expanded our work and are currently active in project development across the country. The Resilient Power Project aims to improve access to resilient power technologies, primarily solar PV and battery storage, in low-income communities, communities of color, and historically underserved communities. Our efforts include policy advocacy, project development support, and education, including publishing reports like these pictured here. We work with state and federal policymakers to advance policies, incentives, and regulatory structures that enable greater access to solar and storage technologies, we author analyses and reports and host webinars like this one. Um, I encourage you to check out our website at www.cleanegroup.org to learn more. Um, I wanted to highlight here that in addition to our advocacy and education efforts, we do work with local governments and community groups on individual project level support to ensure that solar and storage is being developed and implemented in low income um, communities. We're not developers, but we rather work as facilitators. You can see here that we've worked on over 250 projects across the country, a number of which have been developed and deployed. Many projects highlighted on this map are located on the East and West Coast, but we're increasingly supporting partners in the Midwest and Southeast as well. If you're interested in learning more, please visit our website or reach out directly. Now on to today's webinar. Uh, today's presenter is Captain Richard Burt. Captain Richard retired just this month from the Las Vegas Fire and Rescue after a 30-year career in the fire service. He and his family lived in a home for 13 years that was not connected to the electrical grid, but was instead powered by a solar panel and battery system that Richard designed and installed himself. A longtime advocate of renewable energy, Captain Burt was instrumental in the fight to keep the solar industry alive in Nevada. He is the founder of Solar and Fire Education, SAFE which provides free trainings to firefighters across the country. The mission of SAFE is to teach firefighters how to safely mitigate a residential structure fire involving solar panels and batteries, and how renewable energy can help communities across the country become more resilient to power outages caused by grid failures. Captain Burt spearheaded a disaster relief effort in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. 
the mission resulted in the installation of 15 microgrids on strategically placed fire stations across the island. These microgrids enabled the emergency services to stay operational and save countless lives even after the complete destruction of Puerto Rico's electrical grid. He was awarded the Medal of Honor from his fire department for his work there and continues his disaster relief work as a technical advisor for nonprofits such as Solar Responders and Empowered by Light. Thank you for joining us today, Captain Burt, and I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody and Happy New Year. Uh, good news. I just retired, actually, 30 years and three months, but who's counting? Um, this is really exciting. This is, this is a passion of mine to teach this. Um, I want to I talk about one thing. It's the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. And the number one failure for firefighters that leads to a line of duty death. So not the cause, but what causes a line of duty death? The number one reason from all their years of research is a failure to complete an accurate risk assessment. Now, as much as renewable energy is gonna become part of our community, it's critical for the industry, for the renewable energy industry, to have the first responders, the firefighters, that deal with this new technology train. And then we will be able to, to basically grow this industry to where it should be, saving lives. Firefighters save lives, renewable energy saves lives. Those are two critical components. We are studying how renewable energy saves lives with point of use electricity, with battery storage, but we've failed on educating firefighters how to deal with this technology in millions of homes across the country. So that's what this class is about. So Sunrun is the largest residential solar company in the country. I went to Lynn, the CEO, co-founder, and said, we need to start an educational platform. And so Sunrun stepped up and said, yes, we need to do this with you. And a high tide raises all ships. And Sunrun recognized that there was a lack of education at this point. So they have sponsored this education for the last three years for free. So I've been able to go to departments and talk to organizations across the country and give this education for free because Sunrun's doing that. And so um, fantastic that your industry's recognizing it and being proactive. So kudos to them. Let's go to the next slide. So what are we going to cover in this? What's critical right now is residential solar and battery storage is everywhere and firefighters don't understand it. And to make it thrive, we've got to get them to understand this. So this is about guiding you and talking to your customers. If you're a fire chief, if you're a lieutenant, talking to your firefighters about understanding this. So we're going to look at industry standards. What do firefighters need to understand about the in industry standards and the installation processes that go into this? We've got to really dig down, look at suppression and ventilation tactics. It's critical that a fire truck, when it pulls up on scene on a working fire, on a residential structure fire, has the tools to put an incident action plan together. Basically, where they have a plan, they know what they're dealing with, and they can mitigate the incident. So what we're gonna talk about is what do they need to know? And the industry is primed to do this. You can do these outreaches to these fire departments so they know. And um, we're gonna practice looking at basically how do we show off utilities? And we're gonna practice resolving dynamic scenarios. What's gonna happen when a house on fire, what does a firefighter, what does a fire truck, what does a ladder truck, what does a heavy rescue need to know to mitigate the incident? And by the end of this class, you'll have information to be able to reach out and we could start this educational process. On a, on, I've been traveling and teaching this course, but this way we can accelerate that education. And it's for everybody. Remember, we've got the industry that saves lives. We've got the firefighters that saves lives. We've got to combine that and educate and work together. Next slide, please. So 
When I'm talking to firefighters about electricity, when you're talking to customers about electricity, I use water for firefighters because they understand water. Battery storage is a great way. I talk about how storage in a battery, if, a, if you have an engineer here who drives a fire truck, they understand how much water they have in their tank and they understand the hydrant. It's the same. It's grid electricity and stored electricity. So what I do is I use a fundamental, simple platform to say, okay, energy, water stored in a water tower, every firefighter knows what that is and knows how energy, as you go vertical, stores energy for the water to overcome friction loss. With electricity, voltage is very similar and they start understanding that concept. And with voltage, it's resistance that has to be overcome. With water, it's basically friction loss. So if you have a water tower and it's filled with water, you've got stored energy there to overcome the friction loss and you can provide water for a whole community. And strategically, if you put that water tower in the right place, you've got enough energy stored in that vertical height of that water to overcome friction loss. You don't even have a pump. Voltage is very similar. So when I talk about voltage to firefighters, I talk about the idea of getting past resistance. Now current, which is very critical to keep firefighters safe and for citizens to understand, current is that water flowing. So if you connect the pipe and you open the valve at the bottom of that water tower and there's enough energy stored in there to overcome friction loss of the pipe, you're gonna have flow. It's very similar with storage. If you have voltage and amperage stored, and an energy source that can overcome resistance, you're gonna have flow. So my biggest point on this slide is for firefighters to relate the two and say, don't let your body be the pipe for the water and don't let your body be the conduit for that electricity. So it's very important to start explaining it at a very basic level. There's tons of information out there, but it gets buried in reports. This way you can start talking to customers about storage. This way you can start approaching firefighters and relating it to something they, they know very well. Next slide, please. So when you have complete change in how we look at utilities, when we are looking at a new technology that saves lives, and when I say that, I've been in disaster areas where I've seen this technology save lives. So what we need to do is understand how it's changed. For the last 100 years, we've been doing the same thing in the fire service. Utilities, utilities haven't changed. The gas shutoff hasn't changed. The water shut, shutoff hasn't changed. A propane tank has not changed. Guess what's changed? Electricity, for the better. So we've got to start educating on what does this utility look like? The same thing we've been doing for 100 years in the fire service has changed in us overnight. And that's what we're gonna look at. Next slide, please. So on a residential structure fire, at three in the morning, you have fire trucks pulling up. How do they know? This is one of the big questions is, how do they know, are they, where are the solar panels? What are they? Where are they? Are they on the roof? Are they on a ground mount? Is there storage? So the first question is utilities and why it's critical because any fire, when you have firefighters entering a home to put a fire out, one of the most critical things is to keep them safe. And one of the first assignments is to control utilities. And so we've got to start educating the fire service on where this utility are, what, how they're signed. This is low hanging fruit for the industry to do outreach, to make, renewable energy thrive. So we start talking about labels. Where will the label be? What will it look like? Will it indicate there's a battery? Will it indicate are there solar panels? And we have to start educating on how to do this because in the fire service, it's a, and if there's chiefs and lieutenants on the line, they'll laugh because it's a boring job for firefighters to control utilities on a working fire. They wanna fight the fire, but it's a critical task. And so we usually assign it to a company or an engine company, a truck company, or a group to say control utilities, and it's a boring truck job. Trust me, it's not become a boring job anymore. It's actually become a very critical job to understand what, what's powering this house, because you now have different sources of power. So we'll go to the next slide and look at these three sources of power and how do we shut them off.
this 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 uh if you go to the next slide we'll 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 look at how we can shut it off there we go so the number one critical aspect is ventilation because when you go to shut off a utility on a main breaker there's never been any kind of need for ventilation but with storage now we have to look at the panel locate where the storage is and now we've got to understand that this storage can actually off gas so we're looking at something that can collect gases that can explode that can catch on fire now that's nothing to be scared of because there's lots of things that are off gas we're used to flashovers we're used to basically backdrops we're used to where there's a collection of gases explode that's not scary to us what we've got to understand is recognizing what can we do about it and this is where the simple techniques come in ventilation so the idea that you have a company pull up and go okay there is some storage we've got panels we're shutting everything down we know where to go to shut them down but is it in a confined space we have to understand the fire service that we have to critically ventilate an area in case there is a collection of gases it's not something new we do in the fire service it's recognizing when we do it and so positive pressure aggressive vertical ventilation all these things can happen very quickly on a fire scene but we need that information to get to the fire service because these batteries are not just stored outside back east they're being stored in basements. They're being stored in closets. They're, they're being stored in garages. They're, they are stored outside, but there's lots of places. So this education, especially for industry to outreach and talk to the fire service about that, this is what my training is about. So saying, okay, we know where the battery is. We need some ventilation to be proactive. Let's ventilate it and then shut it off. The thing that renewable energy was being labeled with was this is a new technology, it's dangerous, and we don't have the tools in the fire service to deal with it, so it shouldn't be part of a residential plan in a community around America. That's wrong. We have the tools to do this. Next slide, please. So, there's three sources of power now. After we ventilate, and we understand the buildup of gases, we understand that it could get exposed to some heat because the actual technology is very, very, very safe. But in a residential structure, you're dealing with other stuff that catches on fire. So the point here is the failure of the battery may not have caused the fire. The failure of the battery didn't cause the temperature change. It was the stuff inside the house, the garage, the basement that caught on fire and heated the battery up. We've got to understand we're putting these into homes where there's hundreds of thousands of residential structure fires a year. We just got to understand the components. So as we start an aggressive interior fire attack, the firefighters have got to start thinking of three sources of power. We've had one source of power for a hundred years and it's kind of failed us. The grid has kind of failed us because when it shuts down, you have no power. We have to start thinking about three sources of power. So disconnecting the grid has not changed. We follow our standard operation for this. This has been taught for a hundred years. There isn't a firefighter coming out of rookie school who doesn't know how to turn a breaker off. But it gets interesting. I want a firefighter out of rookie school now to understand there's three sources of power. So this is the first, we turn it off. There is no question a firefighter doesn't, everybody knows what to do with this. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so now we're getting into that. Whoa, the solar panel. Wow, all this, all this information that's out there about solar panels. So it's another source of power. Whether it's daylight or nighttime, this is another source of power. And we have to isolate that power. How do we isolate that power? And what I say is identifying those components with the labels, and you could do walk-arounds. You can talk about this. You can present this information to the fire service and say, okay, there's going to be a disconnect for that find the disconnect and shut it down. We used to handle all bladed disconnects. We're used to that. We're not used to inverters. But after a firefighter looks at an inverter, sees an inverter, sees how simple it is to switch it off, 
It becomes part of that knowledge, just like a breaker on the main grid. There is nothing new here. They're used to turning off breakers. So being able to switch off an inverter, now you're talking about three sources of power. Now they're starting to understand, okay, we have this grid. We're used to that. Now we have a source of power on the solar panels. We can shut that off. And let's go to the third one. Next slide, please. Okay, now we have a battery. So we have these solar panels making electricity. We have the grid that we're used to, and then we have this battery. So what does this battery do? Well, it stores and it charges and it discharges. So at this point, we've got to understand, well, we've got to isolate that too. So electrons aren't moving between all these components. And what we talk about is a basic, again, it's not the boogeyman. It's something simple that we can identify and turn off. Now we understand that it can cause gases to ventilate. So before we turn a battery off, we're thinking, okay, we ventilate the space first, which we can do with positive pressure ventilation with our fans. All these techniques aren't new to us. We can do this safely. We can find the battery and we can turn it off. It's a bladed switch or it's a, it's a switch, a very common switch like we have on an inverter. And so if we start understanding the components, we can do this quickly. If you don't have this training, a firefighter pulls up and recognizes the main grid shut off and goes, what's the rest of this stuff? And they don't know what to turn off. So that is so critical to start understanding these components at an organic level. It's not more dangerous. It's understanding it and how to shut it off. Let's go to the next slide. So there's an example of a back east installment. And we start talking about this and identifying it so firefighters can understand that the gateway for the Tesla, if we can start showing the components where you can shut something off and it isolates the electricity, it's critical because, as I said, we can turn a grid service off and know what we've done. If we turn a gateway off, what have we done? But again, what a fantastic piece of equipment. The firefighter understands it and understands how easy it is to turn off. They've just got to recognize it. They've got to understand the inverted disconnects. What I teach is a blanket. Uh, approach is to turn everything off. And firefighters, if you can get firefighters comfortable with not analyzing too much and just shutting down equipment with bladed disconnects and with gateways, you're not going to have an incident where they forget something. What you have now is built in a very, very safe way of doing it. It's the same approach with a main electrical service. We can either turn the main disconnect off, or we can look at the grid panel and say we can turn all these off individually. But the idea is it's a simple concept. What we've done is lag behind in education, so they're uncomfortable with it. That to a firefighter is intimidating. Give me five minutes with a firefighter and explaining it, they've got it, and they've got it at three in the morning when they've got to do it quickly. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so now we've got thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of panels on roofs and residential structures. And what I've heard, the myth about this technology and how critical we need millions of solar panels on homes because we have drastic grid failures. My goal is to get fire service comfortable with it so they understand it. So when they see a solar panel, they go, I don't have to go to this house when there's a grid failure because there's someone with a uh, breathing problem or oxygen and their, their oxygen machine just turned off. They can drive past the house and go, wow, these people are backed up. That's fantastic. They can become independent from the grid. That's, that's an awesome thing. So we have residential structure fire. This is intimidating. What are we going to do? So let's go to the next, let's go to the next slide. Again, what we're looking at here is what I build into is strategies and tactics of something we've already done. Yes, it's a new technology. There isn't much education about it, but here, this is, this is some of the stuff that we've been studying. So you can tell firefighters, it's okay to put a fire out with solar panels, but there's distance. What you wanna use is a straight stream from 20 feet away. If you've got solar panels on a roof and they're on fire, it's very easy to extinguish that. 
firefighters have got to understand the proximity of what they've got to use. You can use any kind of inch and a half, all the different fire flows we have in the fire service. This is a simple way of saying, use those, be 20 feet away on a straight stream. If you start going into a fog stream, which widens the pattern of the water flow, you can get a little bit closer. What I teach is do not touch the panels. Firefighters always want to get on a roof. Very aggressive vertical ventilation. There are other tactics and strategies we've learned in the fire service. So we can get away from that. If we can't go vertical, we can go horizontal. We can do vent, enter, isolate, search, which is another tactic. What I'm saying is we've got to let this technology thrive because it's saving lives. The question is the fire service understand how to deal with this. So I talk about we don't touch the panels because there is an electrical hazard there. And just like the main grid, we don't touch the main grid. We don't touch the panel. So we move somewhere else on the roof and find a safer place to do that. So at this point, we can put water on it. We can put the fire out. We don't have to let the house burn down. And we have to understand that we don't touch the panels. If we can cover the panels, we cover them without touching them. We can use three millimeter black plastic is a great tool. We have heavy tops. And if we can lay them over the panels, especially during daylight, or if there's truck operation shining uh, light on the panels, we can do this. All these strategies and tactics are available and we've used them. It's a matter of integrating this new technology to them. Let's go to the next slide. So basically we stay away from the panels. Now, there's electrons traveling through the conduit in the roof and firefighters got to understand where does this electricity go from the panel? Where does it go? Well, it goes to other pieces of equipment, just like when we drive down the street and see power lines. Firefighters kind of understand where that power goes. We've got to start educating firefighters on that. And we've got to say, don't ventilate on the roof. Stay away from the panels. You can put it out and basically start getting a good understanding of what we're dealing with and we can adapt to that. That fire service do that all the time. It's just, again, this is a new technology. And on a roof, if there's an area clear of all this equipment, we can go back to vertical ventilation. It doesn't mean you never have to cut on a roof again. It's just understanding where you can cut and where you can't. When lightweight trusses became part of building in this country, it made it cheaper, they're stronger, but there were dangers for firefighters. We had to understand that. And that's what we did. We did a very good job educating firefighters a lightweight trusses. And this is what we've got to do with the renewable energy. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, extinguishing a battery fire. This is where the myths and the legends and everything else comes out about what, this is a new technology. No wonder misinformation or Training that basically was based on lead acid technology is dangerous for firefighters. So what I talk about batteries at a residential level is, again, the technology is very safe. And basically, Tesla hasn't had a fire event with its power. But if it's in a basement, with other stuff in the basement and the other stuff is on fire, guess what? The battery's gonna be exposed to heat and it may catch on fire because of the amount of energy in that fire, whatever was on fire, could easily overrun the battery management system of a battery. So I talk about, it's not so much the equipment catching the fire, it's just involved in a residential fire. We can't just let it burn on a residential structure. What we wanna do is say, do we have the tools to put it out? So. Again, if we can get a straight stream 20 feet away, we could start putting the fire out. As we get closer to it, and we're, let's say we're in a more confined space, we can go up to five feet away with a fog pattern and put the fire out. So what I'm arming the industry with is to get the education to the fire saying, we just won't let a house burn because there's a barrier. Yes, we need to ventilate. Yes, we need to isolate it. Yes, we have to understand where the electrons are going. We can, we've done that with the grid for 100 years. Why can't we do that with renewable energy? And yes, we can put the fire out. So 
after the fire is out, it's really important to understand what do we do with this? What do we do with this battery? We just call the power company, the fire service. Come on. Um, we have knockdown. Can you uh, notify utilities, gas, electric, water? That's what we do. So the industry's got to understand who's the firefighter going to notify? Who's the officer in charge? Who's releasing the scene? What does he do? He's got to understand that this battery is still got energy in it. It's not his job to mitigate that, just like with utilities. It's not our job to do the gas. It's not our job to do the water. We let the gas company in evaluate. It's the same with this. We have to arm the officers with the information to say, okay, we need an expert to, list, to look at this. We don't touch this. We mitigate the incident. We put the fire out, but then we educate the owner of the property if they're there, or we call dispatch for a resource to come and look at this so they evaluate it. What we have to understand is after the fire is out, we cool the battery down because it's really important to understand that we cool the battery down so it doesn't catch on fire again and we have a certified electrician come out and look at it. This is simple stuff we can teach firefighters and that's my job. That's what I've been doing full sprint for the last two and a half, three years. So let's go to the next slide. So. On battery firefighting, again, we're talking about residential. We can use water, which is a great tool. We have plenty of that in the fire service. We have plenty of water. We have the hoses to do the correct streams to put the fire out. We don't want to use foam or chemicals, which is good because, again, we have plenty of water. There's electrical hazards when it comes to touching the battery we have to have an expert look at it after we put it out but we can do our job of putting it out and cooling it down and we have all the ppe to protect ourselves we have breathing apparatus we have turnouts we have everything we need and we have the tools to ventilate an area so it's not like we have to come up and design a new piece of equipment what we have to do is train really hard so the firefighters understand how their equipment can work to mitigate this safely. It's connecting those dots. All this is very simple in the fire service. It's a matter of showing the way, leading the steps, outreach program and training. Start that dialogue with the fire service. Let's go to the next slide. Again, done a, I've been involved in a lot of testing and what we're looking at are the fundamentals of, okay, when a battery catches on fire, because it's involved in a residential fire, it didn't cause a problem, it didn't catch on fire, it's just in a garage full of stuff and a garage caught on fire. And we have thousands of those, basement fires. We have thousands of residential fires. It was involved in that. What do we do? Okay. We can put the fire out. We can use water. We can use all our protective equipment, our SCBA. We can cool it down. We can call for a resource to come and either remove it or make sure it's safe. And we know that this battery, once it's cooled down and we've put it out, has the potential because we're not the experts and we haven't taken the voltage out of it, there's still potential energy in it to rekindle and start another fire, even 24 hours, even 72 hours after the fact. So we know that, we have that information now. We can relate that and start talking about how we're gonna mitigate that. If we don't know that and treat it like anything else we've dealt with, then what we're gonna do is set up failure for the industry because of the lack of education. So this is the basic standard for how we deal with it. The tactics and strategies are not that hard. Let's go to the next slide. So this is where we, we will discuss that. This morning we'll discuss what do they need to know through a scenario based situation so let's let's jump to the next slide okay you pull up and you've got this now 
there's a lot of firefighters that have said, well, can't put water on it. Um, I don't know what to do. This is where, if we can break this down, yes, this is a source of electricity. Yes, it's during the day. Those panels are most probably producing electricity. We talk about how are they connected. We know how grid wires are connected. Let's, we discuss how are they connected? How are they producing electricity? Can we put water on this? And these are decisions that have to be very, very quickly. A captain, a lieutenant, a chief, first on scene, looking at this incident, can't just sit there and go, well, okay, what am I going to do? So, like we talked about, what can we do? We can put water on this. We know that for a fact. If we use a straight string from 20 feet away, we can put this fire out. If we want to get closer, we can use a fog stream, which widens the stream from a straight, and we can get closer and we can put this fire out. Now, after the fire is out, we have to do overhaul to see if there's any fire within the attic, if, if, if it's gonna continue to burn with embers and so on and so forth. So what can we do to turn this off? How do we turn a power? We can cover it. We can say, okay, we've got plastic, three millimeter black plastic, we've got canvas tops, we can cover this. We can shut down the electricity so we can start working around this. And we know to talk about the fact that talking to the, the, the owner of the house saying, you need an electrician to come and evaluate this. These are all things that we can do. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next slide. So if you have a garage fire, again, you pull up on a working fire and there's a battery inside this garage. What are we gonna do? Well, we're going to say, well, we don't know what started the fire, but there's a large fire in the garage, and obviously that battery is going to be affected if it's on fire. What can we do? Well, we can use a straight stream. We can use a fog stream. We can put the fire out. At that point, after the fire is out, what are we looking at? Well, we can be looking at a battery. It's still hot. It's off gassing. We need to cool that down. Okay, after we've cooled it down, what can we do? Well, we can call an electrician to evaluate that to make sure there's no electricity in there so it may not catch in fire again in a day or two days from now. We can look at the fact that we can tell the people that own the resident, listen, you need to call your electrician, you need to call somebody who's qualified enough to look at this so we can mitigate the incident. But what I'm saying is we have the tools to do this. We have the protective gear to do this. This is an eye of our realm. Of practice we can isolate we know where the shutoffs are if we can get to a shutoff we turn it down turn it off so this becomes a very simple scene for us with the right education it's not becomes an overwhelming dynamic scene that we don't know what to do because of a new technology that's the change I'm looking for is the confidence to say well we've got the tools to do this let's just do it in the correct manner I identify it let's go to the next slide Okay, we have flooding all over the country. And again, water and electricity do not mix. So we talk about basic understanding. If there was a grid line sitting in that puddle, no one would walk through it in the fire service, they would know. They wouldn't do that. So if you're dealing with a house with panels and maybe storage, what do you do? How do you deal with this? Again, you evaluate it just like anything else. You identify it, you start shutting down, the three sources of power. You shut down the grid, you do that automatically on a flooded house just to make it safe. Now you know, okay, well, I'm gonna shut the battery down and I'm gonna shut the panel down. How do you shut the panels down completely? Well, a great way to do that would be not to touch them, but to throw uh, some black visqueen on them or a top. That way you've isolated it to those panels and you know that we're customer service based. To know this information, to be able to give the resident, that kind of peace of mind and understanding is our job. And all it takes is a little bit of education and the outreach between the industry and the fire service. Because these are incidents that are gonna happen and they're gonna happen thousands of times. They're just gonna involve a new technology. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, you have, I was on the heavy rescue for 10 years, one of the busiest heavy rescues in the country. And um, you got two teenagers get hold of vodka for the first time. And they drive through the side of a wall. The thing is, this is something we've seen. 
But what if there was a battery on the other side of that wall? What if there was a battery and solar panels on a house where they drove through and they just took the inverter and the battery out? What do we teach firefighters? Again, we break it down. Okay, we have structural collapse there. We had kids trapped in a car that we have to cut out. What do we do with this battery that's crumpled up at the end of the car? Okay, again, break it down. This is a battery that was connected to an electrical source. So yes, there's a danger there. Do we touch it? No. Do we pull a protection line to make sure it doesn't catch you on fire? Yes. We know what the distances are. We know how to handle it. Are we in PPE, protective equipment? Yes. FCBA turnouts? Okay. At that point, we know that we have to call a professional to come and look at that battery afterwards. Do we know, is there enough stored energy in that battery that once it's disconnected, is it the same energy as a grid? No. That's why I talk about the different fundamental differences between a battery and the grid electricity. If there's wires dangling down from the panels and the solar panels, do we touch those bare wires? No. Can we turn the panels off? We can cover them. So can we set a fan up to ventilate? Yes, we can. These are all fundamental things that we can do very simply, very quickly if we recognize a problem. Remember, recognizing the risk saves lives. Let's go to the next slide. So. This is a very, very short lecture, but I do an in-depth training for free across the country on this. So whoever wants to set up an outreach project to the fire service so we can thrive as an industry. You isolate the three sources of power. Firefighters have got to understand if you do something for 100 years, a habit for 100 years, you've got to train to change that habit. And that's technology. We have to train to change that habit. habit. Ventilation, we've got to understand batteries in enclosed space need to be ventilated first. Very, very easy tactic. We can do that very, very simply. Very, very important. We can use water, fantastic news. We know the distances, we start talking about the fog pattern and the straight stream. So we can use water to mitigate a problem on a residential structure fire. And do not touch the solar panels. Have a qualified electrician Basically, look at this. This is not our job. We don't look at the grid services. We don't go and problem solve a line drop to a house. We call the utilities to do that. We don't pretend to understand that. We've got to say as an industry, we have to have the experts called for this. And we've got to remember details about the battery because it's customer service. We don't want to leave a scene and have a battery Basically, because it's damaged, because there was a fire in the garage and it heated the battery up and there's some damage to that battery to rekindle. So we can add that customer service element. So basically, our customers, number one, we protect their property. Number two, we save lives. But my most important job over the last 30 years was to protect my firefighters. That was my number one goal. And simple education can do that. So we're going to be taking questions now, and I hope this gives you an understanding of what we need to know so we can start that outreach. I watched hundreds of people dying in Puerto Rico because of lack of power, nothing else. They weren't drowned. It wasn't structural collapse. A tree didn't fall on them. It was because there was a massive lack of power. And the firefighters couldn't do their job because they had no power. People couldn't communicate because they didn't have p power. And it caused a catastrophic event. My understanding of what we can do as an industry, the solar industry, to put this kind of brilliant technology to make somebody more resilient in their own home is critical. But we've got to make sure the brave men and women that protect these homes understand this technology. Thank you, it's question time now. Great, thank you so much, Richard. We have uh, quite a few questions. I encourage you, if you have other questions to that pop up, to send them through. I can always share them um, if we don't get to them. So just to start out, um, 
Our first question is, for those buildings that require emergency backup power to support fire pumps, things of that nature, do you agree that NFPA 70 and 111 allow for batteries to be the source of that power? In particular, that a conventional generator is not necessarily required unless by a local and out, uh, unless by a local code. So, what I would say is that NFPA they're doing the research on this and saying what is critical and what isn't. My lecture, my lecture series, and what I educate on is saying what would storage do that a generator can't do, and so. For me, I'm an advocate of moving away from generators and using more storage and using a generator as a third party. So I'm advocating all the time to say logically, it's critical that you have a backup system. What do those two technologies give and what are the advantages? You look at a generator, uh, three phase, 60 hertz, 240 was perfected in 1890. So what I tell fire chiefs around the country is, you've got this fire truck, beautiful fire truck, high-tech fire truck, strap a couple of horses to it, that's what's backing up your fire station right now, the same technology we used in the fire service, just for an analogy. So the idea is to say, yes, there is a new way, that all the, all the diesel, Generators failed in Puerto Rico. They got water in the diesel, and there was no diesel. So they had two days of running, then the diesel went out. And so storage is a renewable energy source that doesn't need a feed of diesel from a FEMA team that's running diesel to that in an isolated area. You set it up, it's done, you can monitor it remotely. So my, my concept of this is yes, but they've got to start sorting out the safety aspects of it, where this battery goes, what does that mean? We know what the safety aspects are to a generator, the fire service, how to respond to it, what's it going to do in a fire, how do we mitigate that incident? We've got to be more proactive on what do we do with that battery, how the fire service deals with that battery, what's the safety aspects? So that side of it, that's where that argument is starting. But it's critical, I think it's critical to be part of that solution completely um, we had quite a few questions just regarding general recommendations you would give for buyers who are interested in solar and uh, battery storage for their own home what would what are the types of questions that they should ask just so that they're prepared on how to handle an emergency rather than um, just from the firefighter perspective are there any questions or um, documents that homeowners can use to educate themselves and what to do in the event of an emergency so you're asking if a, you, a homeowner that invests in, this, who invests in this wants to know what they can do for the fire service to outreach to the firefighters or the firefighter themselves want to put this in their home? No, it's more so for like the average homeowner. Is there anything that they should be reading up on just so they understand their own things that they can do in the event of an emergency or an issue of how to handle that? Or should it just be totally yeah, related? No, very much so they can educate themselves on this. Number one is they can follow after basically the, this technology has been installed. Number one, follow the guidelines of clearances. What we find is people put, uh, put these, these systems in, they become very inert. They become just, they're working every single day. Uh, and they ignore it. And what they do is they start storing boxes in the garage. Oh, we got the Christmas stuff. Let's put it next to this battery. So, but there should be a clearance between that. Just simple things like housekeeping in the sense of keeping stuff away because these place, the, the batteries are usually stored somewhere uh, where you store stuff. And so just that simple guidance alone, understanding where the switches are. What you can do as a resident, it's very simple. The fire service, we have MCTs, which basically means we can pull up information when we're going to your home. If there's an emergency, you can, or I, I, I even uh, implore the, the industry to do this. Set up a registry. Go to the fire service and say, with the, with the customer's obviously um, acceptance of this, is say, we've put in this many systems. Here's the information. This is where they are. 
so we can build that into our MC, MCT. So when we pull it up, they can say, hey, we have solar panels and a battery. This is where they're located. These is very low hanging fruit to keep everybody safe. The, 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 the resident can understand, okay, find an electrician, ask the company to stall it. Okay, what if we have an incident at three in the morning? I hope it never happens, but who do I call? I can call the power company, I can call the gas company, I can call the water company, who do I call? These are very simple things that the customer can do too to be proactive. Go down to the fire station and say, hey, I've got, a, I've got a system on my house, have you seen one? Can you come and look at it? These are all very, very simple things and you start building that relationship. We've been doing that for a long time in the fire service. Just because it's a new technology doesn't mean we, we can't continue those traditions of outreach and talking and building this information to our system to help mitigate an incident safely. Great, thank you. Um, you've described the process of shutting off all the electricity when arriving at a fire scene, but in some cases, those sources um, are powering the emergency equipment in multifamily buildings. Is there consideration for leaving the battery or generator on so that the internal sprinklers and ventilation can continue to operate? So at that point, that's that risk assessment. That's understanding whether you do shelter in place or you evacuate. If you can understand the system and know that it's not exposed to any fire and that you haven't got firefighters working in an area where they're pulling ceiling, squirting water and need protection from electricity, of course we can leave it on. The, the, that's where that understanding the system, what it backs up, where those electrons are moving, and that's where pre-planning comes in and say, okay, in Las Vegas, we shelter in place because it's one of the most critical life-saving things we can do because we understand where the fire is, where the smoke is, how it's isolated and say the best thing to do is keep that person in their hotel room because we don't want 2,000 people in the corridor. And so, yes, that's where that combination of knowledge, understanding, where the electrons are moving, where it's safe. I completely agree with that. But you've got to do pre-plans. You've got to start understanding where you're going to be working and where you're not. So that's a fantastic thing to understand and say we're going to be proactive on that because that battery in an elderly, uh, elderly community home running 10 oxygen, oxygen machines is the difference between running it, protecting it, keeping it on, and having a mass casualty of 10 people de -satting. So yeah, completely agree with that. Great. And a clarification question. Is the information and the guidance that you provided today the same for both lith lithium battery chemistries as well as for lead acid, or is it focused on lithium? So with the lead, I, my home I built um, 17 years ago, 18 years ago now, had lead acid because this technology wasn't around. So um, with the lead acid batteries, Basically, you're gonna see older installations with lead acid batteries. What I'm saying to you is that training and that information is out there already because the lead acid battery has been around for 50 years. So this training is for that new technology where we haven't had the training on it and the understanding. Um, we've had exposure to lead acid batteries. And to me, lead acid batteries, is an inferior product now because of that, because of the jump in technology. But we've been dealing with a lead acid battery for a long time with the acids, with the plastic, with how they're charged. There's no battery management system. So it's a completely different animal. Um, mine is for the lithium ion and the newer technology put on the residential structure fire side of things. Great, thank you. Uh, there seems to be a wide variation in code requirements for how much of a roof can be covered by solar panels. In some places, there must be a three-foot margin on multiple sides of the roof. I have heard that the reason for these requirements is because many houses have natural gas, which makes vertical ventilation important. Is that true, or do you think that we should be able to standardize the building requirements for roof coverage? So, again, that's... Uh, uh, something I've been working on and understanding why do we have that three foot margin? So the idea is to get firefighters on the roof safely so they can move around the roof. The question is, do we have to do vertical ventilation every time? And with natural gas, we can do positive pressure ventilation. We have 
dielectric fans that do not, we can work in a confined space that do not create a spark. So the idea is we can build into our tactics and strategies, very aggressive, positive pressure ventilation, where we are using a different tactic than vertical ventilation. So at this point, the argument is, do we actually go to the roof in the area where the solar panels are? So that is something that is still the industry's working on, the fire service is working on, and the idea of not touching the panels, not going to vertical ventilation. If you don't know where the conduit is and you don't know where the panels are, you've got to look at that risk assessment. So risk versus benefit. And so that argument is still up in the air. And so basically the idea of that is what I want the fire service to do is if you have an incident with solar panels on a roof and you can't get to the roof safely, don't go to the roof. Use the plethora of other strategies and tactics we have for, vertical, uh, for, for horizontal ventilation, vent and isolate search, natural ventilation. We have other strategies and tactics to deal with it. Great. Um, as part of your training, do you offer samples of SOPs that uh, people can adopt, that fire stations can adopt for their own department? Yes, I just finished an article for firechief.com and rescue1.com. And basically, because of, there's a massive request for that, what I've done is after my training, I've had a big request to build an SOP. I don't pretend to go into another area and say, this is what you should do, because in the fire service across the country, we have different strategies and tactics for different reasons because of different building construction and everything else. I will not tell a fire chief, a lieutenant, this is what you should do. What I'll do is I say, humbly, here's some information that I think you could build a really solid SOP using your strategies and tactics and your building codes and everything else that you're dealing with. So yes, that's coming out. There should be an article being uh, uh, put out to the fire service on that. So after the training, yes, I give them something to build an SOP with. Great. And, you know, as we're closing out here, a lot of the questions just focused on how do folks um, contact you? What is the process for being able to get a training for their own department? Or um, are you able to also conduct trainings for larger inter-office uh, inter meetings rather than just fire departments? How do folks get a hold of you to, to figure out next steps? So um, I think uh, the Clean Energy Group has put, um, you've got my email. That is the best way to get hold of me, um, is directly contact me through my email and uh, the solar and fire education at gmail.com. If you could post that all, all, after the webinar too, that uh, that's fine with me. That is the best way to get hold of me. As I said, this is a grassroots drive to education. This is This is grassroots education i um it's so critical that we get that information flowing and yes i'm open to education across the board and so i will i'll be able to dictate whether it's important to come or send you information but yes this is available so we keep firefighters safe and we keep saving lives at the the residential st structure level renewable energy saves lives Wi-Fi saves lives. Great, and for all of you that asked, we will be sharing a, uh, these webinars are recorded, so we will be sharing a copy with everyone, and maybe we can include Richard's contact information in that follow-up. Um, but if you do need his email, we have added it to the webinar speakers page that you're looking at right now. So with that, I just wanna say thank you again, Richard, so much for um, participating in this webinar. We had a, thank you everyone else for joining. We had a lot of great questions today, and I encourage you to continue the conversation. Um, with Richard into the future. Thank you, everybody. We do have a couple webinars um, coming up. Applying new data from NREL's state and local planning for energy slope platform, which is coming up on Wednesday, January 27th, as well as designing hybrid combined heat and power systems and introduction to new features in NREL's REOP light tool, which will be Tuesday, March 2nd. So if you're interested in those, please visit the website and register. Thanks again to everyone who attended. Have a great day.